Master Tavern Keeper's History of the Old World. Oh, yeah. And so you awoke to find an Arabian knife to your throat. What happened next, Master Tavern Keeper? Ah, well, I heard a voice emanate from the dark silhouette of a man who stood over me. He called out over his shoulder to others gathered beyond the cave's ingress. He lives. The Outlander lives. Then Olesi could drag him out here so we might see what we have found and decide what to do. And that is exactly what they did. I was far too weary and bleary to resist. I had understood what they had said. My uh, Arabic is not too bad, don't you know? We had uh, a pair of Arabian twins from Lashik on our boat, from whom I had uh, learnt it. Anyway, two tribesmen took me under each arm and dragged me out onto the scorching sand, the heels of my boots leaving two grooves behind me. The heat. By the gods, the heat outside was like having an oven door slammed against your face. And not only that, the light too. It was, um, well, let's say, oppressively bright. I closed my eyes as the sun above bore into me and tried to uh, twist away. But they made sure I remained face up. The whole thing was a tried and tested method of uh, dealing with prisoners, you see. It's always best to keep those you've captured confused disorientated and uncomfortable. It makes them a lot more pliable. They threw me onto my back and then joined the circle of nomads who stood around me. The ground was burning hot and I quickly stood unsteadily, admittedly, and did the only thing I could. Nothing. Apart from squinting at the tribesmen who were preventing my escape. That was, until one of them then stepped forward and fixed me with his gaze. It was the group's leader. A man I would later learn was called Brahmin. He looked me over, shaking his head as he did so, and fingering the ivory pommel of his sheathed blade. I was sure this was the end. I could see no reason why they would not kill me and take all I owned. He continued to shake his head as he eyed me up and down until his eyes, for his eyes were all that I could see, the rest of him being wrapped in the faded blue indigo robes of the Tuareg, came to rest upon the head of Tamo that still dangled from my waist belt. Anebonian head. Or is he g- Show me the blades that you found on him. Now! By this point, my eyes had adjusted to the brightness of the morning sun, and I saw that all the men around me were dressed in the same blue robes as their leader. Urzig, the man who had found me, pulled out the two blades I had bought in Cathay from under his robes. They were still caked in the blood of the creatures that had ambushed us in the Swamp of Terror. Orzig then passed them to Brahmin, and the leader looked at each closely before licking one of the blades and then immediately spitting into the nearby sand. (coughs) Its corpse eat the blood, the blood of the followers of the great. 
He then turned to address me directly. Do you understand me, Outlander? I nodded, and then in my best Arabic, answered that I did. You've the accent of Lashik, but the skin of a man from over the sea. You interest me. I have use for a man who can take the head of an Abonian and kill corpse eaters with only a pair of daggers. Let me make you an offer. Join us or die here now on the sands beneath your feet. What do you say? And, well, obviously, I joined them. They returned my knife to me and they gifted me a camel to ride. Its former rider had uh, met an untimely end three days earlier, I later learned. It was another flea-bitten wretch, but at least it could control its bladder, and it was a damn sight better than walking. Aside from Brahman, all the others avoided me. They would not meet my gaze, nor exchange words with me. Brahman, in contrast, was very friendly. I soon learned that he, too, was well-travelled, and he endlessly questioned me about the places I had been and the things I had seen. He, like the twins on the Ava Phantom, was originally from La Chique and had once been a corsair on the Tylian Sea until an encounter with the flotilla of Nehekaran warships out of Zandri had hunted his ship down and sent them to the bottom of the ocean. He was the only one that had survived in as far as he knew, and had managed to make it back to land, swimming ashore close to the oasis of a thousand and one camels on the pirate coast. Rather than return to Le Chique in shame and face the wrath of both the Sultan and the families of his dead sailors, he walked off into the desert, where he was found by a warband of wandering Tuareg. He too had been given the same choice as I. Join or die. Upon joining, he had quickly risen to uh, lead the troop through a combination of luck and, uh, let's call it, the precise and focused application of lethal force at crucial points in time. Ach, oh, do you mean he killed his way to the top? <laughs> I might do. Anyway, it did not take long for things to change for me also, as a chance, although a potentially fatal encounter, gave me the opportunity to truly earn my place in the Tuareg. We had been heading west for a number of days, moving around the northern stretches of the deep desert, south of the ruins of Bel Aliad and the lands of the Muzil, although our paths did not cross these uh, scholars of the sands. I remember we were leading our camels around a particularly tall dune. It was a windy afternoon and the sun was low in the sky. We had intended to rest a while in the shadow cast by the rise of sand, but fate had a different idea. As we walked, we were suddenly hit by a shower of sand spray and a snake-like monster burst out from the slopes of the dune we were perambulating over and attacked us. It struck at the nearest Tuareg to the beast, a young man named Yakia. He screamed silently as he flailed about in the air, dying before the rest of us even registered that we were under attack. I remember staring at his blue-clad limbs as they kicked and punched uselessly before my eyes were drawn to the centre of his body, where a sticky black stain of blood was beginning to spread from the ancient curved blade that protruded from his chest. 
the creature raised him up higher still, and I saw that the blade was attached to a long, ornate stave held by a pair of spidery long skeletal arms, each, in turn, connected to one of the ancient Nehekaran sepulchral stalkers. Those fearful constructs of the sands, mentioned in the 13th hour of the book of Amneta Kertet, also known as the Kitab al-Akira, a fragment of which I had fortunately studied in my youth at the University of Nom. Oh, yeah, Avot, you are uh, perhaps getting a little too technical for the likes of us. What are these uh, sepupupupuku um, singomi uh, stalkers? Uh, ah, I think you're trying to say uh, sepulchral. It means tomb. And uh, yes, these stalkers are, uh, well, they're like the Ushabti, another of the uh, terrifying constructs of the lich priests of the tomb kings. They are, in essence, simply statues that have the lower body of a snake and the hunched upper torso of a man. Crowning the curved spine of each of these sepulchral stalkers sits a skull that glows from within, emanating an eerie, baleful light. And, like the Ushabti, at the core of each of these is the soul of a fallen hero of Nehekara, one whose remains has been mixed with the eyes of a cockatrice and trapped beneath the sands of the desert to guard the land from invaders. It was our uh, good fortune, thank Ranald, that it was only one that attacked us that day. Had it been more, I fear what the outcome would have been. Anyway, realising what it was, I held up my pair of daggers to both shield my eyes and reflect back the baleful stare of the creature. The Tuareg next to me, a mean-spirited man named Boozin, was not so quick-witted and must have looked directly into its eyes. I saw his skin scintillate as a sheen of foul energy washed over him, ossifying him in place, transforming him into a statue of sand. This pillar of silica did not last long, though. It was a windy day, and within moments, a gust blew over Buzin, and he evaporated into a zephyr of sand that spiralled out of his sleeves and scattered into the desert. All about this horrible scene was chaos. The camels had panicked and dragged off half a dozen men by their reins as they fled. The beasts were not alone, though. Some of our comrades willingly joined them in their rout, leaving just six of us. Brahmin, Ursig, myself, and three others. The sepulchral stalker now hurled the body of Yakia away and moved to the next nearest nomad, old Bekai, and bloodily cleaved him in two from shoulder to hip. The two Tuareg nearby stopped still, but not due to the magic of the sepulchral stalker, rather they were frozen by fear, their waters soaking their robes before trickling down their legs. Do not look at it! Shield yourself from its eyes! I screamed out before pulling on the Hat of Illusion and running up the dune to try and get behind it. As I ran, I saw another of the Tuareg crumble into a shower of golden grains. Fortunately, those that remained finally regained their wits and began to avert their eyes. I had to move quickly, but with the hat of illusion on, the world had slowed down for me, and I had a chance. It just remained for me to use it. In the book of Am Netra Kertet, a book that describes a night in the underworld of the Nehekara, the heroine, Thoris, meets Twelve different beings as he journeys through that dark domain. At the thirteenth hour, dawn, her way out is blocked by a sepulchral stalker. It tries to petrify her, but she reflects its gaze back at it 
with her mirror shield. She then uses the inside curve of her kopesh to disarm the creature and lops off its head, leaving her free to leave. I wished to do the same. I pushed hard against the fall of the sand that was rolling down the dune in the wake of the stalker's attack. Brahmin saw me. He seemed to see my intent and came forward defiant. Do it now. Kill me. I'm here. Do it. The creature stopped for a moment before burrowing down into the desert. I was at a loss. Brahmin too looked about him wildly, but it did not take him long to find the beast. The sepulchral stalker burst forth directly under Brahmin, thrusting its weapon into our leader, impaling him. Blood gushed from the wound, but he still grabbed the blade and his eyes met with the desert revenant. But this was also the moment that I struck. I ran from the top of the dune to land on its back, jabbing one of my daggers deep into its shoulder as I did so, and narrowly missing the row of bronze spikes that protruded from its spine. I then hooked my leg around a pair of these, swung under its chest, and shoved my other blade deep into its neck. It was like sinking my knife into a pile of washed up seaweed that had desiccated in the sun. I did not let this perturb me though, and kept slashing and cutting this way and that until I struck bone. At this, I changed my grip and hacked at the weaker cartilage between the vertebrae, and was soon satisfied with an audible clunk. The hissing and thrashing of the creature suddenly stopped and the weight of the oversized skull ripped it away from its body, dropping down to the sand. At this very moment, I finally got to see the face of Brahmin, his features grim with determination but lined by pain, etched perfectly in sand. As one, the body of the creature, myself, and the sand sculpture that had been Brahmin tumbled to the ground. Our leader became a cloud of sand particles that expanded out and was gone, mingling with his beloved desert. The hat of illusion slipped off my head and time returned to normal. I could do nothing but pant like an exhausted hound. When my senses returned to me, I saw that the survivors were cutting me out from under the beast, slashing away at limbs and cutting away the straps to its ancient armor. Relics that would fetch a pretty price in such places as Martek, Kofa and Lashik. Urusik stood over me. It seems we have underestimated you, Outlander. We have need of your sort. You are now Tuareg. I nodded in response at the admission and acceptance. I thank you, brother. As such, though, I claim the rights of trophy. This is my kill and my plunder. The others then stopped and backed away as I pulled myself up. The head too is mine. Do not look at it, for even in death, power remains in those infernal eyes. I wrapped the head in a cloth bag and likewise tied up the creature's armour and weapons. It took us another day of travel on foot 
to uh, locate the camels and men that had run away. And, uh, well, that is how I joined the Tuareg. I stayed with them for uh, another eight months, meeting many and seeing and doing much, until one fateful day in the city of Martek, a familiar voice called up to me. Why, Septimus, long time no see. L- L- Ludwig? Ludwig Brambledown? I, I, I don't believe it. How did, how did you get here? How, how did a halfling cross the desert? <laughs> I've my ways. We've time to discuss all that. I guess uh, Gensha was right. As usual, you did survive the ambush, and it was you that the Tuareg have been speaking of. But, irrespective of all that, I have a question for you. Are you ready to go home?